if you are interested in what's coming with ARC, um, please feel free to look at that video. And of course, we can discuss it during um, the project discussions. OK, so um, now I have to go very briefly because I've lost a couple minutes. Um, but at any rate, um, oh, go ahead to the next screen. So you can go to the ar-c.org website, and we're just going to go through these really quickly, um, Ursula. so just keep going. Um, ARC is um, the organization that sustains MESA. Keep going, Ursula. Keep going. Uh, 18th Connect. Keep going. Nines. ModNets. St uh, Studies in Radicalism Online. Quirk. Near and DigiDS and Muso, um, and then go on to the next slide. ARC currently contains metadata for over 2 million objects, as you can see here, next. The participants in ARC and its governance, which you can see on the ar-c.org website under About Governance, are organized scholarly communities that peer review, select, and aggregate into the ARC catalog via our solar indexer digital scholarly resources relevant to their research communities. We, uh, next, we call these communities the ARC nodes. These nodes and their scholarly communities that provide online finding aids um, in the specific research areas for scholarly resources that they have peer reviewed are aggregators of data. They do not contain nor publish digital property. They only point out to it, link to it, for searching, including full text searching. Next. The ARC nodes point to items collected in two ways, either through peer review by each scholarly community or next. In the case of proprietary resources, um, the communities will select which of them to include. So 18th Connect contains all of EBO and ECHO and all the nodes um, select journal titles from Project Muse and JSTOR. Next. Um, in, in the case of um, proprietary resources, um, I'm sorry, I got a little lost here. Hang on. Uh, in the case of proprietary resources, oh, so each scholarly interface therefore allows searching open access scholar gen generated digital resources and proprietary resources at the same time. This is the equivalent of we used to when we taught women writers make photocopies of their works and students would immediately get that women writers were photocopied and men writers were in hardbound books. Um, so this is putting the digital scholarly research sources right in there with the proprietary resources on the same footing. Um, next. ARC provides the social and technological infrastructure for member nudes, nodes. Next, according to our current cultural current infrastructure, projects deposit flat RDF XML files with internal identifiers. They deposit them into our GitHub repository, which are then in, they're then indexed into Solar for faceted searching. Next, our Solar server Lucene search engine feeds search returns into all the node interfaces, as well as into bigdiva.org, which provides a vi visual interface for searching the whole ARC catalog. Next. You can see Big Diva here, and I'm sorry, there's an error on this um, slide uh, underneath those two um, randomly wild um, boxes saying Big Diva big screen and Big Diva small screen. Um, what you see here is a, a dialog box that explains how to use Big Diva, which you can encounter at BigDiva.org. And then you can see um, movies at these uh, tiny URLs, um, one Big Diva big screen and one Big Diva small screen uh, that will show you how it works. Um, oh, next. Um, this is Big Diva in action. And part of our transformation uh, in working with links, which I'll say more about in a minute, is that it will be, um, that we will uh, be developing Big Diva into a linked open data viewer. Next. Our wiki at wiki.colex.org documents the ARC metadata um, scheme for submissions. The met, oh, next. The metadata that um, 
uh, that projects and proprietary organizations generate for ARC is assigned a Creative Commons Zero license. Um, next, ARC contains over 2 million digital objects contributed by five active and three developing communities. Uh, if you want to ever see what Alan is talking about happen in real time, attend a meeting where we try to figure out what a digital object even is, because <laughs> uh, it's not clear. Um, okay, um, next, there are thus two ways to join the art community, e either as a project by submitting your digital resource for peer review to one of the nodes or to create a new node. Next. Spurred on by our work with the Linked Infrastructure for Networked Cultural Scholarship, or LINCS, uh, which I hope Susan Brown will be discussing um, at some point, um, we have rebuilt the back end, and that's fully explained in the video posted on the YouTube channel for this workshop, created by ARC project manager Lauren Lieb and programmer, as well as ARC's director of technology, Brian Tarpley. Next. Corpora allows searching the new ARC catalog, which is now a Mongo database using Elasticsearch, by content type. Um, and here is the agent Susan Brown. Susan has published articles that are available via JSTOR and cataloged by ARC. And of course, there is another Susan Brown, you can see that at the bottom, who wrote something in, um, it looks like uh, 1789, um, uh, that is uh, in the Lilly Collection at the University of Indiana. We would not um, equate those two people. Uh, next. You can, in the back end of Corpora, using Neo4j, visualize relationships among entities, and this helps us with disambiguation. Next, the primary uh, reason for this back end luxury is to allow our, allow our student workers to disambiguate URIs, uh, which will enable our local identifiers to become universally understandable. Next, disambiguation via, via corpora involves merging entities with irregularly encoded names. We recommend regularization, but we can't hold our projects to it. Um, next, this is a sample RDF record, which projects have, have to generate. And they've had to do this um, and will have to do it until Corpora is fully implemented as ARC's back end. Um, next, filling out forms in, oh, back, I'm sorry. <laughs> filling out forms in Corpora will be much easier for the groups that want to contribute data. Next. So the original model for nines that extended to ARC included each node paying a project manager to help scholars create RDF for their digital resource, resources that have passed peer review. As we learned from the experiment at the University of Virginia, which stopped funding nines, this is not sustainable. Next. Corpora simplifies the task Filling out corpora forms can replace the RDF XML creation and editing processes for projects and nodes. Student workers at the ARC office can, can perform value added tasks, such as adding VIAF and other identifiers. Next. Um, this work is funded by the Lynx project and ARC is working closely with the Lynx ontologist Aaron Canning. Next. As a result of our work so far, Corpora can now spit out turtle RDF, which you can see compared to our original RDF files here. Next. I'm going to now talk about the history. You should have some idea of what ARC is and where it's going. Um, no one knows, next, better than we do at ARC, that Bethany Novisky is a genius. <laughs> but that genius, for us, that genius has manifested itself in her original work on nines. 
This um, article in EBR discusses that work. She's now a dean. So Dean Novisky directed the creation of Colex built before there were content management systems like WordPress or Omega. She began development in 2003. And Colex became Blacklight, which is a major uh, library infrastructure hosted by Stanford. Um, she also planned the ARC metadata scheme using the resource, resource description framework or RDF that is now the basis for linked open data principles. She was 10 years in advance of her time realizing that this was going to be important. Next. This is the original Nines interface as Bethany designed it. I think it's brilliant. I would love to go back to it sometime, but it was too soon. People would know how to use it now. They would have patience with learning all of the um, icons and their meaning and how to manipulate them. Um, I think it would work now. Bethany's focus was primarily on tag sharing and building a research folksonomy among romanticists and Victorianists. And I want to say that that hope was really gutted by um, academic prestige culture. Uh, and I can say more about that in the discussion. I don't know if it's um, something that is possible in the future, but it's certainly not possible even now. Next. Um, Bethany worked at the time as a graduate student with Jerome McGann. And Jerome McGann, of course, started Nines, um, whose main goals were a, to develop a system for searching through all the ro major romanticist digital resources at the same time that wouldn't involve copyright issues. So the Blake Archive, Romantic Circles, Whitman, Rossetti, they'd all worked out their copyrights. We needed to be an um, aggregator that just pointed to them so that we didn't have to engage in, in copyright law um, to, uh, you know, for uh, the purposes of display on our site. Um, he also wanted to, um, oops, I've lost my place again. Um, oh yeah, he also wanted to prevent a brain drain of early scholars in digital work by offering peer review and um, our project manager, so 18th Connect, you write a letter that P&T committees understand about why this was accepted and the amount of scholarship and work that went into it um, and even making equivalents like this database is the equivalent of a book or four articles or in order to help P&T committees understand. And then McGann's third objective was to situate these scholarly digital projects in a complete research environment. And that's where we started bringing in proprietary resources as well. Resources as well. Next. Thanks to Bethany Novisky, um, Nines developed and ARC has continued to revise a complete guide to our metadata standards. And I want to say about Nines metadata and then subsequently, which subsequently became ARC metadata, Nines was the original ARC, so to speak. And then as we expanded out and um, incorporated more scholarly communities, we needed an overarching structure. So that's ARC. Um, and this met these metadata specifications have been built from the ground up every time a new node enters into the arc catalog we have to revise all our metadata categories uh, so the first one was when we welcomed mesa medieval uh, into the it was just nines and 18th connect and nines and 18th connect had a genre category called manuscript um, because some people like Wordsworth deliberately chose not to publish things, at least until 1850. Um, and well, he didn't choose, he was dead. But um, at any rate, the, um, you know, so we had to, um, we've always had to revise our metadata scheme whenever we incorporated new projects. Next. We use standards where possible and then include our own taxonomies using the Colex namespace. And the, the significant um, uh, and built from the ground up taxonomies are um, involved DC type, which is basically our format category, um, Colex discipline, which is disciplines to which these documents, uh, these uh, resources are interesting, um, and uh, Colex genre. Playing the three off against each other gives us the flexibility we need. 
Next. I wanted to discuss two major changes in ARC since its beginnings, the ARC Constitutional Congress and the Great Reindexing. Uh, next. After the success of Michigan State University's special collection, Studies in Radicalism, which became a node, the ARC board realized that we needed to break the McGann legacy of including only MLA field specific nodes, early modern, 18th century, 19th century, modernist, um, et cetera, along with Mesa medieval. Um, we had originally called these the founding nodes, which is I think symptomatic. And Alex Gill attended an ARC meeting and helped us realize uh, how kind of oppressive this structure was. Uh, and so it led to what we called a constitutional Congress in which we demoted the founding father node model and created an egalitarian inclusive ARC infrastructure, um, which is allowing for the launch of DigiDS, for instance, digital disability studies. And now we're calling for all kinds of things like animal studies, book history, post-colonial studies, et cetera. Um, next. I'm going to skip this next. In the process of this, we realized that an ARC node to be defined as such has to do two things. It has to aggregate data and selectively index data, either through peer review or expert, expert curation. Next. Um, the links project offers us an opportunity to compete with and provide information to Google search and Wikipedia. Next. Helen Gorgas shows why that's important. Searchers and researchers often don't leave the first or second pages of Google search results. Next. If you asked a student to search for digital medieval manuscripts, the important Romain de la Rose project appears on page five of Google search results. Next. If you search Big Diva and just slide the time slider, which shows the whole art catalog, slide the time slider down to 1485, Romain de la Rose is prominent with the British Library and Stanford's Parker Library. These are some of the most prominent medieval manuscript collections. Next. I'm just going to um, let um, Ursula, scroll through these these three, uh, and you can stop there with genre values. Oh, go back one. Sorry. Um, in 2016 in Krakow at the Feminist Infrastructures um, Panel organized by Susan Brown, I argued that ARC was a feminist infrastructure because of it allows agile metadata development. We've got this new metadata, but it took us two years and lots of money. Um, we want to keep up the pace of um, evolving ARC from the ground up as new nodes come in. And you can see here, for instance, that um, things like visual art are very general, whereas we've got some specificity in film and music. The specificity comes from the incoming projects. What do they need? How do they need visual art divided up? and then we will implement it. And thanks to Corpora, we can do it really fast and inexpensively. And this is just my concluding slide, next. So the development of ARC has been hampered by um, proprietary software building, Solar, Colex, all of those things were built for Jerry McGann by performance software. The costs for changes have been exorbitant. Um, it's been hampered by personnel costs. Each node with uh, needs its own project manager. Corpora is going to change that, and it makes re-indexing easy. Uh, it, it allows um, uh, us to not only um, re-index as new projects come in, but to adequate to multiple ontological systems, to adequate the elements in our taxonomy, with multiple ontological systems. In other words, our things will always have many names and um, we, um, we will point you to all the names and all the nuances of those names. As Lynx opens its triple store and includes the ARC data, the 2 million digital objects, what we hope is that that triple store profoundly influences the world of Wikipedia and Google, Google search um, 
because we want to be able to offer to digital wanderers who are searching for answers to a particular kind of digital wanderer, the one who just rejoices in the idea that it's complicated <laughs> and uh, will be willing to pursue multiple levels of adequation that do not work. Um, I hope this has been um, uh, clear enough and thank you very much.